I have to thank um, Mark for uh, inviting me uh, to this seminar. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I apologize that I don't speak French. I, I speak, of course, French, uh, but I don't train it. Uh, and um, therefore, if I would start uh, talking in French, it would, the, the talk would take much longer, and probably it will be even worse to understand than I use English. So um, I would like to talk to you about using carbon dioxide uh, for chemical transformations, especially in context with energy. But I would also start actually very general. And some of the things uh, Mark mentioned in the beginning, I would also probably um, touch in my, uh, in my lecture. Let me start with a very general view on, on chemistry or on chemistry related things from the outside. So if you talk to most people on the street, chemistry is not considered to be actually the good science. It is more or less the science which creates the problems. Um, but I would like to convince you actually in my talk that, that we need chemistry to solve the problems which are associated with energy technologies, but also with other things. So if you ask someone looking at these various pictures and ask him what is good and what is bad on this picture, then most people probably would say this is good, but this is bad. Of course, I choose these pictures by intention, and the opposite is true. So, so you might know this is aconite. Also, I believe it's the same word in French also, a nice flower also, but very toxic also. So don't put it in your garden, actually, when you have small children. Uh, this, is, this is rhubarb. Rhubarb uh, um, can be eaten without any problems. But if you harvest it too late, actually, it contains a lot of oxalic acid, which we might actually produce from <laughs> carbon dioxide also. And so you should not harvest, at least in Germany, I'm not sure how in France with the harvest, not after uh, July or so, because the concentration of oxalic acid is too high, and this will be, cause problems in your kidney or create kidney stones. And this is the famous, actually, South American uh, frog, which produces one of the most toxic compounds uh, we know on Earth, much more toxic, actually, than dioxin or so. Um, and this has been used by the Indians to prepare actually their arrows actually for hunting. And the two chemical plants you will see here, one is actually a hydrogen plant, which has to do also with my talk today, because I will talk to you how hydrogen is produced today. And the other one is a nitrogen plant, and uh, nitrogen uh, um, production is probably one of the most, or probably the most important chemical reaction made by man on Earth because it provides our f the basis for our food. And I can assure you, every second nitrogen atom which you will eat at lunch today, I assume you will have lunch, or which you have at breakfast, comes from this process. Because uh, it provides actually the efficiency for our, for our agriculture. And so every second nitrogen atom which we daily eat comes from this process. Um, as I said, chemistry is considered to be creating problems. Um, but in reality, actually, chemistry can help us to solve problems. Um, we talk a lot about, I would say, from a Western perspective, or from a global perspective, of small problems every day. But, and we often forget the very big problems. And uh, you might know, of course, that despite we have enough food, we have a problem of distributing food. We have uh, a significant amount of the world population has n which has not access to water, and an even bigger amount of people have no access to electricity. And all this actually, uh, at the same time, we see a scenario of a growing population. Two years ago, there was the seven billion people born on Earth, and soon we will see we will have eight billion people in the next decade on Earth. And and the question is, how can we provide wealth? Uh, and also to solve these problems in, in the future. Now I would like actually to move to carbon dioxide. And I, I like to call carbon dioxide, and we had discussed this also yesterday at the dinner, I like to call this uh, the Janus molecule. Because uh, as you might know, the ancient Roman god Janus, everything, or the coin, everything has two sides. Um, 
Carbon dioxide is the basis of our life. Without carbon dioxide, there is no life on Earth, because we are all carbon-based compounds. On the other hand, an increasing concentration of carbon dioxide creates also problems. 97 of 100, so not 100 of 100, 97 of 100 um, researchers working on climate predictions say carbon dioxide has already today an impact on our climate. Um, but I believe all agree if we increase the concentration in the future, it will definitely have an impact even if it has not today. So what we see actually uh, also, and, and there is, one can discuss, this is talk for its own, the, the relation, what we see actually is, we, we see a change of the climate. I'm not saying, to be clear here, it's because of carbon dioxide. As I said, there is still some debate. It's very likely, but it's not 100% not clear. But what is absolutely clear at the moment is that we see actually an increasing um, melting of the ice. And this is a picture, uh, this is data actually which I took uh, last week uh, from, from the news. Uh, I was giving a talk in Rennes on, at a conference there and so uh, on, um, uh, on some of our chemistry. Uh, and uh, what is absolutely clear is that, that we see a significant um, increase of the melting of the, of the polar ice. Of course, we here in the Western Hemisphere, we don't recognize climate change because it's gradual, but here you can really see this. So this is the Arctic ice boundary in 1979, and since then actually 20% of the polar ice cap uh, has melted away. So uh, actually, this is also often not considered if we really have global warming, it will create winners and losers. And so it will not, it will not create only, uh, only problems, it will improve things also. And what you actually see here is, this is uh, from a conservative scenario, actually the protected impact of climate change on agricultural yields. And what you see wherever it's green or getting more green, the agriculture will be improved in the future because of climate change. Wherever it gets red, it becomes worse. And so what you see, this is also, of course, clear by intuition. In the northern hemisphere, closed, it will, it will become warmer, so our agriculture will benefit, actually, from that. And especially, actually, in, the, uh, in this region here, we will have increased temperatures, also less water, and, and therefore, actually, agricultural production will decrease significantly. Don't ask me actually why Egypt is different. I don't know. I try to find out, but I don't know. Um, so, uh, apart actually from, uh, from the impact on agriculture, of course, climate change has also an impact actually on um, natural catastrophes, on, on, on um, natural extremes. And this is actually taken from the so-called World Risk Report. I apologize, but I took this from the German uh, government web page, so it's in German here. It's called the World Risk Index, but you can, I assume you can find similar things also in English. And this shows you actually wherever again, where it's, it's red, it's getting, it's getting worse. So there is increased, there's high risk actually because of climate change that, that weather extremes will in, in, increase dramatically and so, and wherever it's green, actually the situation is fairly stable. So, um, what has this has to do with chemistry? It has to do with chemistry actually because it has to do with energy and also the, the creation actually of, uh, of carbon dioxide. And uh, Richard Smalley actually he uh, made up this list, and one can debate a little bit also about this list, but, uh, but I believe in general uh, uh, all these points are important, made a list of, of, of global challenges. And uh, he said also that actually energy is a key issue for all of the other problems. Because this is often forgotten actually, if we will have a stable energy, um, um, supply actually, and the clean energy supply, a, um, a, co um, um, 
an inexpensive energy supply, of course, which is important, then of course our world will be safer also and uh, we will have uh, easier ways to generate or to clean water, uh, to, to increase food protection and to solve uh, these other problems. So what, what do we need in this area? We need basically innovation or new technologies. And I like uh, the statement of Albert Einstein in this respect because he said actually, um, if you want to have a different outcome, then actually you, have, you cannot continue with the same experiment. You have to change the experiment. In other words, you have to change technologies. And um, this is actually our view and a lot of other scientists actually in the world how we can change technologies. And you have heard this also before in Mark's talk actually. Uh, Clearly, the main producer for carbon dioxide is energy. And it's also absolutely clear to be here, we cannot produce enough chemicals, actually, to solve the increase of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It's impossible. So, so chemical production will never solve, actually, and I will come back to this point later on also, it will never solve, actually, the increase of carbon dioxide because we produce much more carbon dioxide using fossil fuels at the moment on a global scale. We cannot produce enough chemicals from, uh, from this. So, so we have to change, on the one hand, energy technologies. If we want to really reduce carbon dioxide um, uh, increase, and on the other hand, and this will be then the second part of my, my talk, or the third part, this is not the second, and it will be the third part, um, we, we can use carbon dioxide also for chemical production um, inspired by nature to create a, a truly sustainable chemical industry. But in order to reduce carbon dioxide, we have to work actually on energy technologies. And we have to find ways in the long term, mid to long term, to convert renewable energy. And this all relates to sun and other indirect sources of sun. So it can be hydropower, it can be wind. Um, any type of renewable energy to, uh, to storable energy. Unfortunately, electrons, it's a wonderful source of energy and we all love to use electricity everywhere, but unfortunately it's difficult to store. And so we have to find ways to convert actually renewable energy to storable energy. And there's one concept is hydrogen. There are other concepts. Carbon monoxide is a possibility, the direct deoxygenation of carbon dioxide, and, and several others. I will talk today mainly about hydrogen generation. So this is a conversion of renewable energy to a storable form of energy. This storable form of energy then can be upgraded or even easier stored by chemical reactions, for example, by reacting hydrogen with carbon dioxide to making chemical energy carriers like methanol, methane, formic acid. If we want to use this energy again, this chemical energy, because we can store it, put it on the table, store it, put it in, in, um, in a tank somewhere, and if we want to use it again, we, we can oxidize this or we dehydrogenate this uh, and we can do classical burning, for example, or we can use in a more energy efficient way fuel cells and we produce the energy when it's needed, and at the same time we produce the water, which can be used with the help of sunlight again to produce um, a storable energy vector. This is a project we are working, it's a five-year project, it's called Light to Hydrogen, like in a lot of other cases. We work together um, uh, with uh, physics, with physicists, um, uh, but also with engineers, and I will tell you a little bit about our work, what we did. And it's, you have seen a similar picture from, from Mark early on, and it's of course a simplification what you see here. But I believe like a lot of other scientists, we are inspired, or scientists are inspired in general by nature. And what nature does is it con uses the photosystem two to oxidize water to, uh, to oxygen, which is, therefore we have an oxidative atmosphere and uh, protons and electrons. And these electrons then are used in the photosystem one for the production of organic matter, NADH. So biochemists, for example, work. This is a fairly complicated process, and I will show you the efficiency later on. And in order to improve this process, so not to make complicated carbohydrates 
fatty acids and compounds like that. Biochemists work also on a direct use of this system actually to make hydrogen by combining these photosystems with naturally occurring hydrogenases. And there are two types of naturally occurring hydrogenases. These are enzymes which reduce protons to hydrogen. There is the nickel-based, uh, the nickel-ion-based, and the pure iron-based actually enzymes which can reduce these protons. And one of the approaches um, people follow is actually to combine these type of uh, natural systems and to produce hydrogen in a more efficient way. Unfortunately, and this is the real problem, this enzyme is very oxygen sensitive. And of course, this process always generates oxygen. So photosynthesis, Mark said this before, is a fantastic process. It's a fantastic process, but it's an inefficient process. And I'm not sure if you know the stability, even let's say in normal summer weather in Paris, and what do you think is the stability of the photosystem actually in it's around half an hour. So it's not very stable. It's, it's easily decomposed. The beauty of nature is that it rebuilds the system. This is what, we, uh, what is difficult actually uh, to create in an artificial manner. So the photosystem, as you will see later, it's, it's not efficient and it's not stable. But the beauty of nature is that it can rebuild the system efficiently. So we got... Uh, so we had very simple ideas when we started. I'm basically a trained synthetic organic chemist. And we, uh, as I said, we got inspired by nature. And we thought, OK, let's combine photosynthesis, uh, um, photosensitizers photo -sensit photo uh, similar to the natural system with um, small molecules which might mimic the nickel or iron, nickel iron based hydrogenase. And then we used a lot of nickel and iron complexes together with photosensitizers in the presence of light. And we were very surprised that some very simple, inexpensive iron carbonyls actually can be used with these type of, of course, expensive <laughs> organometallic photosensitizers. But this was actually our start. We made much more actually complicated also models of the photo of the hydrogenases, but they were all not active. The very simple iron carbonyl compounds, where a kilogram cost a few euro, uh, were the most effective ones. Um, science, this is often misunderstood, I believe, also in the public. Science, I, I believe, it pro proceeds stepwise. So we are on the shoulder of shoulder of very capable chemists. It proceeds also by inspiration, very often we got our inspiration by nature, and it, pro and it proceeds, of course, by trial and error. It's still today very difficult, despite all the um, uh, level of, of the highly sophisticated modeling methods. Also, it's still it's it's very difficult actually uh, to rationally plan or develop catalytic systems. So, in order to improve this, of course, this type of science needs understanding, basic science, which is. With, where you understand the elementary processes where you then can do the next step in a more rational manner. And therefore, we looked actually very carefully into this, into this model reaction by combining various spectroscopic tools. And in our institute, we have a specialist actually for operando spectroscopy. Operando spectroscopy is spectroscopy where you use actually various spectroscopic techniques on a molecular level and combine this actually with product identification. And by combining such techniques, actually, uh, we elucidate the mechanism of this, of this reaction. And I will not go into too much detail here. I will just will explain you um, a few things. So you see the various spectroscopic tools which we used. I, probably some of you might not know this, so I will not go into detail. This is, this is elect, uh, EPR spectroscopy, where you can actually detect single electrons very easily, radicals, IR spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy. And with these different tools, actually, we uh, found clearly uh, that actually the, the electron is transferred actually to the ligand, like it's also shown by Mark before. And then the photosensitizer immediately, even at 20 Kelvin, 20 Kelvin, it's, it's very cold, <laughs> it, it transfers the electron with 
less uh, than, than one second actually to the iron carbonyl species. And the real uh, um, proton reduction catalyst is not this hydrido tri undica carbonyl anion, which was known long ago and which is quite stable, but is this very unstable actually dianion. And we also elucidated the activation pathways of, these, of this cluster catalysis. So this is Angelika Putner, who is the, the specialist uh, with whom we cooperate in that area. Of course, using iridium or any noble metal for energy purposes, it's on, a, it's on a large scale very difficult because these metals are on the one hand very expensive, on the other hand, they are not uh, easily available. So there is definitely a goal and, and a, a large actually work of research in the direction to develop um, hydrogen generating system based actually on so-called base metals or non-noble metals or organic compounds. And of, we would love to develop an iron-based photosensitizer. Sensitizer. To my knowledge, there doesn't exist any one so far. Uh, and with the iron, we were also not successful, but we developed copper-based photosensitizer. And copper is much less expensive than the iridium. And um, we were inspired by industrial work on organic light-emitting diodes. And we found that these organometallic complexes behave actually similar to the much more expensive um, iridium complex. And this now is a, is, is, a, is a structure which you, as an organometallic chemist, can easily modify. And you can try to improve the system by changing on a molecular level. We, this is what we synthetic people all, always do. I, I call it making actually molecular Lego, like actually younger children actually put the pieces together with Lego, actually uh, organometallic chemists or synthetic chemists put actually the atoms together. And in, during the chemistry studies, you learn the technologies actually to do this molecular Lego. This is a crystal structure and the comparison actually of this similar to the iridium system. So far, I've shown you very basic work. And you might say, what has all this to do with carbon dioxide? But we will we'll come to carbon dioxide in a minute. Before, I just want to show you that from model studies at a certain point, and I personally believe this is very important for science, you have to go then to real applications, uh, meaning actually developing a device which can be then used at least on a small scale in, in, in a practical manner. And there are various approaches, actually, for the photocatalytic water splitting to, towards such a device. These are model studies, still not catalytic. This is, uh, this is an example what I know. This is heterogeneous catalysis, where people use heterogeneous materials. Um, this is photoelectrolysis, which was also mentioned in, in uh, uh, brief, uh, mentioned actually in the talk of Mark. There are biochemical approaches. And then there are homogeneous approaches, both on the two half reactions of the water electrolysis, proton reduction and water oxidation. And when you start working on these such model systems, at a certain point, you have to come actually also here. And this is also what we uh, started uh, two years ago. And uh, in order to do so, you need more you need heterogene heterogeneous systems. And the, the typical material of support for such a thing is titanium dioxide. There's the famous Honda Fuyushima effect, where, where they showed in early 70s, actually, that you can use titanium dioxide and that the UV part of, uh, of the light can be used actually to exit uh, to, to, to generate electrons and holes actually in titanium dioxide, which then can be used for photocatalysis. And so what happens normally if you put light on titanium dioxide, you all might know titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide are small white particles which are often actually in the white, um, in the white paint actually, uh, which, which people use actually for painting their rooms. There you have titanium dioxide particles. And if you irradiate them, especially with the UV part, these particles actually, they generate a hole and an electron. So there's a split off. This electron then can be used for actually reducing protons or reducing other actually organic compounds, carbon dioxide, like it has been shown before. And of course, the hole actually then is used actually for an oxidation process. Unfortunately, 
This is a fairly inefficient material. There's lots of work to improve this because there is an easy recombination of the electron and the holes. And most of the time, actually, it simply recombines. So the efficiency of the system is very low. You can, however, improve the efficiency of this material by putting a catalyst onto top of titanium dioxide. And there are noble metal based dotated system. There is most of the work done on that. Gold, for example, and titanium is such a material which has been used very often. I think. Silver is also possible. Nowadays, there is a lot of work or significant work in also put, uh, trying to, to achieve similar things with copper based systems. But one thing, actually, one of our goals is actually to develop an iron dotated system active uh, in this area. And this is, of, this is uh, of course, then the intermediate step and the final step actually is shown here. And this is also very reasonable. This is for a synthetic person, I would say, quite uncommon. <laughs> and it took us actually two years to build up uh, this photoelectrolysis unit because it's something totally different. But, and you have also to have sometimes time. Unfortunately, most of our research projects are very <laughs> short-minded and you never have, but especially for difficult problems or big challenge, you have to have some, some time also. To, and so we built up these electrode holders. Uh, we developed an own photoelectrolysis cell. And here you see some of our uh, first results actually from this spring. And you see the effect is very small. So it's a really bad photoelectrolysis, but, it, but th there is an effect. So uh, there is really a positive effect of the photon compared to the normal water electrolysis, although the effect is still much too small. But now we are, uh, we are quite optimistic that uh, we can use all of our um, catalysts, which we have developed before, actually, on the homogeneous side, on the model side, that we can combine them now or put them on these uh, electrode holders on materials and, and to improve the efficiency of the system within the next year. Um, I, this, is a Germ, this is a slide from the German uh, government. So there is some German in, <laughs> and I apologize for this, but I, will, but I will guide you through this slide. This is the competing technology, or I would say today's start of the, the start, state of the art technology. This is actually the prediction for renewable energy uh, for the year 2020 in, in, in Germany. And I can say we are now here. And we are actually ahead of, of plan. This, is, this, was, this plan started actually in 2009, that, or was published in 2009. But we are currently actually ahead of plan. You know, after the, the, the uh, Fukushima incident, it was decided actually uh, to have, by 2020, 50% of the electricity, not of the overall energy, to be clear of, but of the electricity as renewable electricity. And by 2050, it should be 100%. And this is, of course, this is a very ambitious goal and with lots of problems in there, but a lot of challenges also. And this provides also, of course, there is innovation needed. The main source in Germany, which is predicted as renewable energy, will be wind. This is, this is you see here, this is the increase and in the importance of wind in Germany. Unfortunately, the wind blows, especially in northern Germany, where we have very little industry, so you have to find ways to bring the electricity actually to the south and to the southwest. This is the increase, this is biogas, especially bioenergy, it's biogas. This is water hydropower, so you, you see it doesn't change because we already use hydropower since a long time. And there's a little bit also of PV photovoltaics, which is in Germany at least more, more expensive or most expensive renewable energy. Um, much more expensive, actually, than, uh, than wind in the northern part. So the problem with the renewable energy, and this is often not considered, actually, in public, is the, is the, the prediction, the stability. So if I ask you, will there be, on the 2nd of July, in Paris, sun? Nobody knows. Likely, but we are not sure. But we need electricity that day. If we, Will there be on 3rd of October wind? We don't need, we don't know. So renewable energy is not predictable. If we have a coal power plant, a nuclear power plant, it's predictable. This is, the, it's, this is, this, this is much more easy. So 
already today we have a situation in northern Germany that we have in March and April normally the windy season at the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. And in November we have, let's say, no wind in the morning and then we have strong wind in the evening. And if all the installed windmills don't work in the morning but work in the evening, then this corresponds to more than six fully operating nuclear power plants. So now you have to imagine six fully operating power plants go on stream within less than 10 hours and go out of that grid. This is, this is very difficult to regulate because we don't turn down a full a power plant within 10 hours normally. And so what to do with the electricity? At certain points, there is much more electricity in the grid and you might not believe this or so already today we have a situation in our local state which has purest density of population and very comparably little industry, Mecklenburg, Western Pomerania, we have 70% renewable energy and if we have too much energy in the grid actually energy price becomes negative and for example uh, the German railway system even in summer starts heating the um, I don't know the English term for this <laughs> For, for shifting, actually, the, uh, the, the trails, yes. This because this consumes a lot of energy. At some points you have too much energy and at some points you don't have. So, so what to do with the energy? And now hydrogen carbon dioxide comes into the game because they offer you possibility to convert uh, this renewable energy to a more storable energy. We cannot build big batteries aside from a windmill or so. This, this is impossible. Um, so this is, so, but what we can do actually and what is already current state of the art technology is we can actually use water electrolysis either with the help of sunlight then we save energy or without the help of sunlight, to convert electricity to hydrogen. So this is, let's say, this, this is state of the art technology to convert uh, el um, electrons to chemical energy. Hydrogen it's the most abundant molecule in the universe. But unfortunately, it's not available on Earth because it's gaseous and it diffuses off. So we have to make it on Earth. And 96% of the hydrogen today which we use on Earth is made by fossil fuels. Coal gasification, but especially oil uh, um, uh, refinery or heating actually um, uh, and you produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide at the same time. However, you can produce so-called green hydrogen, that is carbon dioxide-free hydrogen, by water electrolysis if you use renewable energy. And if you want to then store, you can either compress the hydrogen, this is what physic, uh, physics le loves or engineers, you can uh, cool the system to produce liquid hydrogen, you can work on cryoabsorption, or you can actually use chemical approaches, you can use hydrides used by the US Army for example, relatively expensive, but applied. Uh, inorganic chemists love these amino boranes or so, although there is no real actually full cycle yet shown. And actually we can again, inspired by nature, making organic hydrides. And this is actually what nature does. This is again a simplification of, of the picture what nature does. Nature converts carbon dioxide and water to organic matter. In this case, I use the example of carbohydrates. And I mentioned already to you in the beginning that the process is inefficient. And this is the, this is the real efficiency. How much energy from a photon ends up as chemical energy? So with the average plant, less than 1% of the original energy in the, in the light ends up as chemical energy. And therefore, it's much more energy efficient, actually, to put solar cells at a certain area and then do water electrolysis to convert it to chemical, then actually to grow crops and to use these crops actually for producing electricity. That is, that, uh, that is much, much less efficient because the photosynthesis, in principle, is a fairly inefficient process. Um, we developed concepts actually inspired by this nature, how, how we can store the energy. So we use hydrogen under the condition of water electrolysis. 
And then we hydrogenate the waste stream of power plants, for example, or industrial plants. That is the waste effluent. You can take out the carbon dioxide from a basic solution. Then you have a, a, a basic solution of carbon dioxide or an amine solution of carbon dioxide. And if you use the hydrogen from renewable um, water electrolysis, then you can hydrogenate actually the carbon dioxide, for example, to formates. You will see later on also to other things, but you can hide it. And this now is a liquid. It's storable, and you can use it at, uh, at a later stage. If you want to use it again, then you decompose the system, and produce the hydrogen again, which you can combust or actually use in a fuel cell. And although the individual steps, I should be very clear, also have been often shown actually um, by scientists before, it was actually our work and the work of Gabo Lauranchi, with whom at EPFL in Lausanne, with whom we published this back-to-back -back as, a, as a full concept. Formic acid is a nice molecule, but like any energy carrier, it has advantages and disadvantages. There is no technology which has only advantages. This is also what we discussed yesterday, what you abs ab absolutely correctly said. That, so formic acid is a liquid. This is better. You can transport it more easily than gaseous energy carriers. It's non-toxic. This is often misunderstood. Formic acid is corrosive, but non-toxic. Uh, it has a low energy density compared to methanol, but it, this process is fairly energy neutral. So the overall, the, the inherent efficiency is relatively high. And this is, a, this is an old experiment. So you see here the more elaborated ones where we use this. And I show you just that, you, that formic acid is it's the only organic compound, actually, where you can generate hydrogen and electricity directly at room temperature from the system. So this is a solution. You see the catalyst is air stable. This is room temperature, <laughs> 20 degrees. And as soon as the catalyst come actually to such a solution of formate, you will see bubbles start, uh, bubbles, you see small bubbles initially here, you will see in a second much better. And these bubbles are hydrogen and uh, carbon dioxide. This is the decomposition of formic acid. And so, so the carbon dioxide is used, is going back. And this hydrogen then can be used with any type of fuel cell application. And this is only one of our first things to demonstrate. That because the hydrogen is very pure, and you have actually less than 5 ppm of carbon monoxide, which is a toxic actually for the fuel cells. Um, this is, this is already a continuous uh, uh, unit where we produce several tens liter of hydrogen, and we are also uh, doing this now on a larger scale. I don't want to make the impression, actually, that in the, in the future our cars will drive with formic acid, to be clear here also, because I showed you this. But this technology which I showed you might be of interest, actually, for hydrogen cars. Five years ago, when we started this, all the big automotive companies, they're only inter interested actually in e-mobility. Nowadays, to my knowledge, we had, an, um, uh, uh, we had a fair last year in December actually at the German parliament, all the, and we had actually, uh, of course, the German auto manufacturers, but also Hyundai, Toyota, for example, there, and they are all interested again in hydrogen cars. It's to be clear also, Hydrogen cars at the moment is definitely from the big car makers considered to be again an option. It's not that it's the only option there is, but it's one option. And, and now this formic acid technology actually can come to the game because if you use formic acid actually there as a hydrogen battery, as you will see on the, you don't need liquid hydrogen like in this car from BMW or you don't need the compressed hydrogen like Daimler-Benz is currently actually um, developing in 2016, they will have the first serious car for hydrogen, a B-class uh, a car uh, actually with working with hydrogen. And so what we developed together with Gabor, uh, so we joined forces, is some sort like rechargeable battery. So we put hydrogen into the system like you put electrons into the system, then the hydrogen is stored, like the electrons are stored, and then if you want, you take it out. So what is in this battery, it's a solution of carbon dioxide or bicarbonate and the catalyst. And as soon as you put the hydrogen in, the pressure goes down because the hydrogen reacts with the carbon dioxide and the bicarbonate to form it. Because of that, the pressure goes down. So you don't need the 600 bars or 700 bars. Then if you take it out, of course, 
the reverse reaction starts and you can really take out. And this works. This, is, we, this was the first demonstration of this principle. In a car, you need to do this 100,000 times. We did it 10 times. <laughs> so still, this is, but, but in principle, it's possible. And that, this is something uh, people are also interested at the moment. So we're getting close, actually, to lunch. And um, <laughs> I'm not sure which food you like more. <laughs> but if, especially if you ask younger people, it's very clear what, what they will answer. And I can, all of those of you who like this more than this, I can tell you why this is the reason. This has to do with energy. And this is energy density volumetric per liter and per kilogram. So this is diesel, biodiesel, gasoline, what we use today in our cars. This is, has a high energy density, both volumetric and both gravimetric. Hydrogen has a wonderful energy density gravimetric-wise, but liquid-wise, because it's a gas, very poor. So here is chocolate, nuts, and burgers. So, so and our body knows this. <laughs> so it's pretty close, actually, to this. And here, where formic acid is, is also broccoli. So broccoli has pretty much the same energy density, actually, than, than formic acid. By the way, what you see here, this is lithium-ion batteries. And this also shows you the, the difficulty if you, cons if, you, if you calculate how much energy density is in a lithium-ion battery compared to that. So when we work on formic acid, actually, the competing technology is replacing lithium-ion batteries, but not really replacing these things. So nevertheless, if you want to actually go to higher energy density materials, then you have to go to ethanol and methanol, so these alcohols. And so we are working also on hydrogenation and dehydrogenation of these, and we developed similar to the formic acid a concept where we use where you hydrogenate carbon dioxide to methanol and dehydrogenate methanol. Normally, heterogeneous catalysts are used for this type of chemistry, but we Parallel, actually, to uh, Hans-Jörg Grützmacher at ETH Zurich, we developed the first homogeneous catalyst system, which actually allow for such dehydrogenation processes. And I will not go into detail here. Again, its understanding uh, is, is also important to develop the system further on. This shows you the stability, so it's, the system is stable for weeks. So it, it's clo close also. To, to a practical application and the amount of hydrogen molecules. This is per molecule of catalyst, so per molecule of metal center is shown here. So up to 400,000 molecules of hydrogen per one molecule of, of expensive metal center actually is produced, which shows you also that it's getting actually close to application. But we don't develop only noble metal catalyst for that. I said before, you have to especially use for energy purposes non-noble metals, so iron, copper, zinc, manganese, things like that. And we developed the first iron-based systems. This is an iron pincer complex, which allows with efficiency similar to noble metals for this type of, of reactions. Uh, Elisabeth Alberico, a visiting science from, from Italy, showed that you can make these type of iron complexes, which then undergo actually carbon dioxide hydrogenation, but also dehydrogenation of, of methanol, actually. And uh, we believe it's similar in mechanism to the methanol. So at the very end, I would tell you a little bit about valorization. And valorization, actually, of carbon dioxide has to do with our resources. And this is a picture, actually, of the world you're more or less familiar with. This is the, this is the picture how it's often drawn. Probably you don't know this picture of the world. This is a picture, actually, uh, from 2009, which shows the ecological footprint of the material. This shows or, or uh, sets the size of the country with respect to the use of the resources and the population. And you see, of course, that the northern hemisphere, and this is also clear on Earth, lives at the cost of the southern hemisphere. We consume much more resources than we have at our places. And in principle, you can say this is OK. But the real problem is not shown in this picture. The real problem of, of the use of resources is that we are not in equilibrium. We use currently as much resources as if, as if we have more than 1.8 Earths available. But we all know we have only one Earth available. So we use much more than is rebuilt. And every 
person knows if you use much more than is rebuilt, at a certain point there is not nothing anymore. So um, we have to find ways actually to come to an equilibrium with our resource, with the use of resources. And this is, I would say, a sustainability. This is, for me, the main point of sustainability. So coming back to carbon dioxide, because this is the main source. Our, our chemical industry is based on carbon. Our life is based on carbon. And I said carbon dioxide, it's, it's a Janus molecule. So we have the problems, of course, with the climate. But without carbon dioxide, there is also actually no life on Earth. And um, the point is, I'm convinced we can build up a fully sustainable chemical industry based on carbon dioxide. And this is, uh, this is not only a vision. A lot of these things are already reality. So if you use carbon dioxide and hydrogenate carbon dioxide to methanol, either with homogeneous or heterogeneous catalyst, this is published example from a heterogeneous catalyst, you can make methanol. If you have methanol, you can use zeolite materials, which we have actually in our detergents a lot, zeolite, to make propene, the C3 building block. And this is not a vision, this reaction. This reaction in the last 10 years, several 500,000 ton scale plants in China were installed doing this chemistry. Unfortunately, methanol doesn't come from carbon, but produces carbon dioxide. If you have the C3, then you can use the well-established shell uh, then you can use the well-established Phillips triolefin process to make ethylene and butene. And then you have the C2 basis, the C4 basis, the C3 basis of the chemical industry, the olefins. You can make methane from carbon dioxide, and you use methane uh, for, oligo for, for um, making benzene, which is also an industrial pilot plant, and then you have the arenes. So in principle, you can trace back all the carbon materials of the chemical industry to carbon dioxide. Why does it... Why is it not done? We don't have the reductives. So the reduction of carbon dioxide, which you have shown before the, for the energy purposes, is also I would, the, the requirement for a fully sustainable chemical industry. And uh, today, carbon dioxide is mainly used in the chemical industry for making urea, but also for carbonates. But we can do further things. And there's a lot of things to, dis to develop, I believe, uh, to, um, to use such reactions in the chemical industry. And I show you some examples with respect to hydrogenation, very recent work. So we developed, for example, the first uh, examples uh, of the carbon-nitrogen bond formation. We published a paper in Angewandte using silanes. Thibaut Cantat, actually, he also here in Paris uh, published uh, at the same time or developed at the same time. Uh, a similar procedure with silanes. Later on that last year, we developed the first hydrogenation, and this was parallel actually to the work of Walter Neidner. And uh, you can methylate, so you use carbon dioxide as a methyl source, so you make like in nature, not only methyl, but you make CN bond formation, so you can make organic molecules out of it. And you can even make labeled compounds for the pharmaceutical industry in much cheaper way compared to previous ways. You can use carbon dioxide instead of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide carbonylation are large processes in industry, million ton scale. And we recently developed a process where uh, this was published in January, not, not in press anymore, in January, where we, where we do similar reactions like the company Lucide is doing in Jurong Island in Singapore, making actually uh, esters from olefins. And um, this works with a number actually of aliphatic uh, and aromatic type type esters. And interestingly, this chemistry actually uh, makes use of an internal reforming reaction. So we use carbon dioxide and methanol, which are both actually much less toxic than carbon monoxide. And internally, the methanol reduces the carbon dioxide, making uh, to carbon monoxide, which then undergoes actually carbonylation reactions. And my last example is, or second last example, is, is a new process for making formates. Formates are produced on 600,000 ton scale, uh, for example, uh, for the preservation of food. And we combined, again, methanol with bicarbonate to make, in a fully atom-efficient process, only water as a side product, actually formates directly. So is it possible, this is my last example, to do such hydrogenation of carbon dioxide also with non-noble metal system? And this is of interest. To us, and in principle, it's possible. 
And I show you two catalysts now, which we developed recently, uh, heterogeneous ones when we moved into heterogeneous catalysis. These are materials which have a core, often a carbon core, but you can also have titanium dioxide core. And on this core, you have either cobalt or iron oxide, so rust in a nanostructure, some sort of nano rust. And the interesting thing is, depending on the conditions, how you prepare it, you have at the core of this nano rust, you have actually nitrogen dotated graphene layers, which really influence the catalysis. And with such catalysts, this is the preparation, how we do it. We combine techniques from homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. We use defined complexes, then we put them in a support, and then we do pyrolysis at 800 degrees. And then these materials actually, they have unique properties and they hydrogenate actually, for example, or you can use them in various hydrogenation and dehydrogenation, for example, also in the hydrogenation actually of, uh, of carbon dioxide. And we were really pleased also when the editor chose this topic actually for the, for the cover of this prestigious journal. This is our view for a sustainable industry. I, I've showed you this in my talk. I think this is the summary. We have to find ways and improve ways, especially in a cost-efficient manner, to convert renewable energy with the help of catalysis and available resources, for example, salt water, to produce reductants. We can use these reductants with carbon dioxide, again, and the waste biomass to make all, actually, of the goods which make our life a little bit more easy and, uh, and nicer. Often people, and this is how chemistry actually can provide um, and improve the situation and help uh, in, in this area. Often people told you on the street, actually, in the past, everything was better. Uh, now we have, the, the food is much more toxic, we have more toxic. The, the reality is, 100 years ago, the average age on Earth, on a global scale, was 35 years. So that was the average age. Nowadays, the average age on Earth is 65 years. So within 100 years, actually, humans have developed technology and improved the situation that our life expectancy on Earth has doubled. And of course, in Western Europe, life is even much higher. But even on a global scale, the, the, the life expectancy uh, was doubled. So despite all the problems I showed you before, is we have significantly improved. And there's, this is also the good situation, although I showed you in the beginning the challenges. So, uh, so what we also see, actually, despite a growing population, despite primary energy, there is a growing wealth of more and more people. So more and more people on Earth benefit also from wealth. Of course, it's still not equally distributed, but it's not the case that less and less people benefit. It's more and more people who benefit from the... Um, from, from science and technologies. So this was actually my talk. I finished with two general statements, which I believe are very true for science, which is often also misunderstood in the eyes of the public. Often people think we should rationally make things. And we discussed yesterday that we both like preparing research proposals. I don't like it because I believe this is very true, what we do in science. We, we have some ideas, but in general, we will prepare for our next era. And then we, so we have, to, we have to elucidate this and then from there on actually then uh, develop solutions. And what is also clear, and this is to the students who are in the audience, um, of course you can think a lot, but you have to work hard also in science. This is also clear. You have to do a lot of experiment. Luck comes to the prepared mind. And like Arthur Fry, you know, you probably know Post-it, you have to kiss many frogs to find your prince. In other words, you have to do many experiments to find the right catalyst. Thank you very much. I'm really happy. I'm thankful to my group. Happy to answer questions.